The Senate will come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Senators Bridges. Strong start for the morning. Appears absent. Buckner. Present. Coleman. Cook. Corum. Danielson. Excused. Donovan. Fields. Gardner. Absent. Janal. Gonzalez. Hansen. Heisey. Holbert. Jaquez Lewis. Kirkmeyer. Coker. Lee. Liston. Lundeen. Moreno. Pedersen. Here. Priola. Rankin. Rodriguez. Scott. Here. Simpson. Smallwood, Sonnenberg, Story, Here. Winter, Woodward, Zenzinger. Excused. Bridges. Gardner. Here. Mr. President. Here. The morning roll call is 32 present, zero absent, two excused, and one vacant. We have a quorum. Senator Hansen. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Colleagues, if you'll stand and join me in reciting the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well played. Approval of the journal, Senator Heisey. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the reading of the journal of Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022 be dispensed with and the journal be approved as corrected by the Secretary. You've heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. The ayes clearly have it, and the motion is adopted. Aye. Senate Services. Correctly engrossed Senate Bills 42, 76, 79, 121. Correctly re engrossed Senate Bills 50, 86, 92, 115. Correctly enrolled Senate Bill 13. Committee reports. February 23, 2022, Committee on Education. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. Senate Bill 137 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. February 23, 2022, Committee on Health and Human Services. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. Senate Bill 106 be amended as follows. And as so amended, be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation and with a recommendation that it be placed on the consent calendar. February 23, 2022, Committee on Business, Labor, and Technology. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. Senate Bill 116 be amended as follows. And as so amended, be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation with a recommendation that it be placed on the consent calendar. February 23, 2022, Committee on Business, Labor, and Technology. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. Senate Bill 113 be amended as follows. And as so amended, be referred to the Committee on 
on appropriations with favorable recommendation. February 23, 2022, Mr. President, the Committee on Finance has had under consideration and has had a hearing on the following appointments and recommends that the appointments be placed on the consent calendar and confirmed. Members of the Advisory Committee on Governmental Accounting for Terms Expiring May 18, 2025, Gina Lanier of Aurora, Colorado, to serve as a representative of school and junior college districts appointed, Anne Penny of Erie, Colorado, to serve as a representative of city and town government appointed, Stephanie Corbo of Golden, Colorado, to serve as a representative of county government appointed. February 23, 2022, Committee on Finance, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following Senate Bill 81 be amended as follows, and as so amended, be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. February 23, 2022, Committee on Finance, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following Senate Bill 124 be amended as follows, and as so amended, be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. February 23, 2022, Committee on Finance, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following Senate Bill 40 be amended as follows, and as so amended, be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Very odd feeling being up here and not having the ability to actually do anything. No, I can't make a single motion. Uh, Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. President. Get used to it. Um, Mr. President, I move the Senate proceed out of order for uh, consideration of third reading of bills, final passage. Touche, Mr. Majority Leader. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. The Senate will proceed out of order to take up third reading of bills. Third reading of bills. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 78. Senate Bill 78, Senators Kirkmeyer and Janelle, Representatives Geithner and Byrd, concerning alternatives to health insurer prior authorization requirements for health care providers that achieve specified approval rate on prior authorization requests. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. I would move Senate Bill 22078 on third and final reading and urge an I vote. Is there any further discussion? Sure you do. I see one discussion. Senator Smallwood. Morning, Mr. President. Morning, colleagues. Um, I don't know how many folks were here when we had our last discussion on Senate Bill 78 on second reading. So some were, it sounds like. And so I, I do want to start again because I was sincere in my comments about wanting to thank the, the sponsors of, in, of this bill of trying to um, at least address an issue that many of us have had at some point, if you've had any care under a health insurance plan, um, that's required prior authorization. If it's required any of the cost containment tools that have been used for years by individual plans, small group plans, large group plans, self-funded plans, and now even government plans. Government plans, for example, want to do this uh, because they've seen the success of cost containment measures in the commercial market, in my opinion, and they're looking at it going, why why should we as the government just be a check writing service? Why aren't we doing the things that the commercial markets have done for decades in order to save costs? So um, when you're a patient and you're told uh, by your physician who you ostensibly like and trust uh, that uh, this procedure that we want to do, this MRI, this CAT scan, this prescription drug, this surgery, before, you can, before we can do that, your health plan needs to sign off on it. They need to approve it. So that would be prior off. If you're taking a prescription drug and your uh, physician, let's say, prescribes something, and ne- next thing you know, you get a call or a letter, or you're at the pharmacy saying, you can't have that medication because, for example, um, it's dangerous for you to take this medication with another medication. Physician A didn't know what physician B was doing. It's frustrating. 
You had a plan and it got disrupted. Uh, you've been prescribed uh, 100 pills. Let's say it's something potent, controlled substance perhaps. And the plan comes back and says, oh, that's too many. It's not safe for you to have a prescription of that size. So a quantity limitation, or what's called step therapy. There's certainly one senator here that's very familiar with step therapy, meaning um, you had, let's be hyperbolic, you have a sore throat and we prescribed you dilated. Okay, that doesn't make sense, right? How about we try something in between? How about we try, I don't know, Tylenol first? And see if Tylenol works for your sore throat, and if it doesn't, then we can move in steps to something stronger and stronger and stronger, right? So these are, these are cost containment provisions, and these are safety provisions, right? What we talked about in seconds is some of this is for the patient's own good. A lot of it is for the patient's own good, and some of it is to contain costs, to look at procedures that might be for example, experimental in nature, maybe unsafe, maybe not tried and true for that particular procedure, right? So there's, there, are, there are a number of really good reasons why, um, for example, and I believe in the introduced bill, um, prescription drugs were part of this. Okay. And as a committee or the bill sponsors in collaboration with stakeholders decided, you know, that's a, that's a bridge too far. We don't want, we don't want to include prescription drugs in there uh, because of the, the safety provisions. And, and I would argue um, there's a lot of that on the medical side as well. So again, I am not, I'm not at all questioning the motives of the sponsors. And candidly, colleagues, I don't really care where you vote on this. And the stakeholders don't really care where you vote on this. And the reason I say that is because the only people that should be up here at the well telling you why they would prefer that you vote no is because it's going to raise costs. It's going to raise the cost of health insurance premiums. A lot? I don't know. I don't know how much. There's been no actuarial review done. But if you have to make a binary decision or in this case, a three-way a three decision, is this bill, ask yourself, is this bill going to raise costs? Is this bill going to lower costs? Or is by telling physicians that they don't have to have their work double-checked, that they don't have to have their decisions double-checked some of the time, is that, does that have a chance of keeping costs the same or lowering costs? And I would argue, no, it doesn't. Arithmetically, that doesn't work. If you take away a cost containment requirement, by definition, it is going to raise costs. Maybe not by very much, but that's what we see in this building. That's what we see in this room. Little tiny steps, adding this, adding that, a requirement here, a fee here, a tax here, a benefit change here, an elimination of a cost containment provision here. Little by little, incrementally, when this all adds up, does this raise or lower the cost of health insurance? It raises the cost, colleagues. And every time we come to the well, we're not having the conversation about what can we do to make things more convenient for the patient? What can we do to make things incrementally more convenient for the physician? That's not what we talk about when we come to the well. We talk about the fact that the cost of health care and the cost of insurance is too high. And I will absolutely 100% concede the point that if this bill is something that would apply universally, it would apply to fully insured plans, it would apply to ERISA plans, it would apply to Medicaid, it would apply to Medicare, and we could go to the physician community and say, we have eliminated prior authorization out of your lives permanently. Heck, I might be a co-prime sponsor of this bill. Because if we could do that and make that change, we might actually take some cost out of the system. But as you know, colleagues, that's not what happens here. With this bill, all we're doing is eliminating prior authorization sometimes for some physicians 
under some plans and not even close to the majority of your constituents, colleagues, not even close. Because this doesn't apply to Medicare. This doesn't apply to Medicaid. This doesn't apply to TRICARE. This doesn't apply to VA. This doesn't apply to ERISA plans. And that is the vast, vast, vast majority of our constituents. So again, if we could do something universally, I'm there. I'm, a, I'm a, at least a co-sponsor, because it can't stop me from doing that. Prime sponsor might be different. So this impacts very, very few folks. And what I would ask you to do, for those of you who are on your state of Colorado health insurance plan, maybe you have an actual physical ID card, maybe you're like me and you have it on the, the app, pull up your card. Pull up your card and look at the back of it and tell me what it says. What it says is, you have, prior, you have to go through prior off. It's on the back of the card. And so, colleagues, that's, that's the last part of this that I'm concerned about is, um, imagine you're a physician and you're seeing a patient and they come in with a card that says prior auth required and you know that because you've done a certain percentage of a certain procedure with a certain insurance company 95 percent of the time successfully your prior auth has gone through and now so you know for these kind of patients under this particular insurance company under this type of procedure you don't have to go through prior auth. Put yourselves in the shoes of the physician and look at your ID card and tell me how in the world is that physician ever going to know that the patient that is in front of them at that moment of time is on an ERISA plan, which the majority are, and this law doesn't apply to, or if they're on a fully insured plan, which the minority of people are, because the card's not going to tell them that. And the patients aren't going to know that. I've had conversations with many of you colleagues asking, are, if you're on the Cigna plan here, are you on a fully insured plan or are you on uh, a, a self-funded or an ERISA plan? We don't even know. Here in this body, most of us don't, don't even know. So how is, a, how is a, pa a patient going to know? And therefore, how are they going to communicate that to their physician? So I don't, uh, I don't have a problem with the, the grand scheme of this. If you're able somehow, some way to have the federal government legislate that prior authorization goes away across the board, this is, this is a good idea to take costs out of the system. But short of that, colleagues, I think we're just adding unnecessary cost increases to the system, with, which, which uh, I don't think any of us really want. And we're adding a, a layer of complexity to the physician community that I, I, I don't think that they, that they even necessarily really fully understand. So because of those reasons, I'm going to be voting no. Um, and you get to make up your own minds. But thank you. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> so prior authorization is a management process used by insurance companies to determine if a prescribed product or service will be covered. This means if the product or service will be paid for in full or in part. Prior authorization is a useful tool to police the small number of providers who order medical services improperly. But for the vast majority of providers, prior authorization has become a perfunctory exercise that creates unnecessary delays in a patient's access to care. When we talk about health care down here, yes, we talk about affordability, but we also talk about access and availability. I'm going to give you an example. A really good friend of mine, late September last year, went in for an annual checkup for a chronic disease that she has. The doctor found a mass in her uterus. It took until December, until December, before she could get 
the necessary services, the MRI, the blood tests, to determine that the mass was not malignant. So when we talk about costs, it's not just the costs to the insurers, it's also the costs to the physicians and the hospitals, but it's also that cost that we can't measure in dollars and cents to the patient, to the mental duress and stress that that patient and her family went through, that many people go through, because it takes so long to get a prior authorization from an insurance company. And there are times, even when you go through prior auth, that it may be denied, and then you've got to start all over. Members, other than the senator from Parker, there was no opposition to this bill in committee. We worked with the insurance, the carriers. We worked with the hospitals and the doctors to get to a bill that if they couldn't support, they at least did not get up and oppose. We accepted amendments to this bill as late as 10 minutes before we heard it on seconds. I'm a little bit confused because at one point, the senator from Parker stated that this was costly, that this was gonna add costs. But at the end of his comments, he said it was a good idea to take costs out of the system. So with that, let me just refer you to an article in the Health Science Journal that considers both the cost of savings of prior authorization and the administrative cost of actually doing them. The Health Science Journal found that prior authorization procedures impose a net cost of $13.2 billion on the U.S. health care system. That would be a net cost. That would be an increase, not a decrease, an increase. And please, yes, put yourself in the place of a physician. Because I asked the physicians what the cost of prior authorization were to them. The cost to complete a prior authorization remains the single highest cost for administrative transactions in the healthcare industry at $13.40 per standard transaction. With the physicians, and CMS told me, physicians and their staff spend more than 16 hours a week, that's two business days, on prior authorizations taking up valuable time and resources away from patient care. When we talk about health care, we talk about patient care. We should be talking about the patient. It, this was peer-reviewed research. And I just want to be clear. This bill does not propose to ban the use of prior authorization. I think everyone would recognize that would be totally irresponsible. This bill does not say that carriers have to provide an exemption from prior authorization. What this bill does is says that it gives an alternative that if a qualified provider meets certain provisions, at least one alternative to prior authorization should be considered. One of those is an exemption to, from prior authorization. The next one is an incentive awarded to the provider that reduces the wait time. Reduces the wait time for the patient and their family. So it's not a ban, it's not an absolute, it's not a mandate that they have to give an exemption from prior authorization. That's only one of it one of the choices. The other one is an incentive. Again, that re award it to the provider that reduces the wait time. That might mean that their prior authorization approvals move to the top of the list because they do such a great job because 95% of the time they are meeting and getting approvals. Or it could be any other innovative program that the carrier can design to reward a provider for compliance with the carrier's prior authorization requirements, again, that reduces wait time. So this is not an absolute. 
And the idea that we have to help every single person in the state of Colorado or else we're not going to pass a bill seems a bit preposterous to me. Because when I talk to the doctors in the hospitals and talk to them about the plans, and they're already going through where they have all these different plans, we figured out, yes, 60% of the people in the state are covered under plans that were mentioned by the senator from Douglas County. But that leaves 40% of the plans that this could impact. 40%, approximately 1.5 million people in our state that could be impacted in a positive way. That patients could see a reduced time to them getting the services that they need. Again, once a provider receives either the incentive or the exemption, it doesn't remain in perpetuity. It happens that they, the carrier gets to evaluate them, gets to audit them. They can audit them monthly. And if they don't meet the 95 percentile percentage, they can exempt them, they can take them off. They can lose either the incentive or the exemption. So, this is an important bill. This helps many people, this helps patients, this helps people get access to services that they need, medical services that they need in a more timely manner. That's the purpose of this bill. It's good for Colorado. It's good for at least 1.5 million people, maybe more. And I urge it, I vote. Senator Smallwood. Thank you, Mr. President. So I wasn't gonna make any further comments, but um, I definitely wanna make sure that um, my statements aren't misinterpreted by anybody. So when I say eliminating prior authorization could remove costs from the system, that's exactly what I mean. And I apologize if I wasn't clear in the fact that if it was done universally, it can take costs out of the system. Because I think it could. What you see in Senate Bill 78 is something that does not eliminate prior authorization universally, not even close. It doesn't eliminate it for ERISA plans, which is the majority of commercial insurance plans in the state of Colorado. Most of the people are covered under a risk plan. This bill doesn't apply to those. So we're not taking costs out of the system for the majority of people in the commercial market. We are not taking costs out of the system for people on Medicare. We are not taking costs out of the system for people on Medicaid. We are not taking costs out of the system for people under TRICARE. We are not taking costs out of the system for people under VA. So I want to make sure, colleagues, that everybody understands my position on it. Universally, yes. This could take costs out of the system. Senate Bill 78 doesn't do that. And when we talk about alternatives, there definitely are some. So briefly, because I know everybody's anxious to vote, extremely anxious to vote. Extremely anxious to vote. There are three things that can happen in this bill. Prior authorization, the elimination of prior authorization is one. Colleagues, does that raise costs or lower cost? Two health insurance, two premium payers. It raises costs, otherwise we wouldn't have it. Option number one, raises costs. Option number two, B, an incentive awarded to the provider. An incentive. When your insurance company has to give an incentive to a doctor, is that raising costs or lowering costs? I certainly wouldn't want to be gifted an incentive that takes money away from me. That doesn't sound much like an award to me. So option 2B raises costs. And there's only one other option. 3. C, line 14. Any other innovative program of the carrier or organization's design to reward provider compliance. 
Have you ever received a reward that takes money away from you? Does a, when you give a reward to somebody, are you adding cost to the system or are you reducing cost to the system? So, colleagues, yes, indeed. I should have spent more time with the three options. All three options, A, B, and C, increase cost to the system no matter how you slice it. So that's why I, one of two reasons why I'm going to be a no vote on this. But again, colleagues, other premium payers aren't up here testifying. They're not up here standing at the well. I'm doing this for those people paying the premiums. That's great that the plans are supportive of it or not opposed to it. It's great that the doctors and the hospitals and everybody else that we love so much is in support of it. I'm here for the premium payers and I'm voting no. Will the clerk please add Senator Zenzinger to the roll? Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the passage of Senate Bill 78. Are there any no votes? Senators Smallwood, Holbert, Lundin, Sonnenberg, Donovan, Rankin. With 27 ayes, 6 noes, 0 absent, 1 excused, and 1 vacant, Senate Bill 78 is passed. Co-sponsors. Senators Moreno. Apologies for making you a plural. Mr. Majority Leader, there's only one of you. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 79. Senate Bill 79, Senators Kolker and Janal, Representatives Young and Froelich concerning required dementia training for direct care staff of specified facilities that provide services to clients living with dementia. Senator Janal. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Senate Bill 79 on third reading and final passage. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the motion is the passage of Senate Bill 79. Are there any no votes? Here we go. Senators Smallwood, Priola, Woodward, Cook, Minority Leader, Lundin, Gardner, Liston, Kirkmeyer, Corum, Rankin, Sonnenberg, Heise, Simpson, Scott. With a vote of 18 ayes, 15 noes, one excused, one vacant, Senate Bill 79 is passed. Co-sponsors. Minority leader, or majority leader. Mr. Minority Leader, you could also be a co-sponsor. <laughs> Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 76. 
Senate Bill 76, Senator Holbert, Representative Mullica, concerning complaints related to a person's authorization to practice an occupation for acts committed while the person is serving in an official capacity. Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Senate Bill 76 on third reading. Ask for an aye vote. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. One individual who I failed to recognize and thank yesterday on second reading would be Representative Mullica. Um, he took a look at a draft copy of this bill, asked for one very minor change to which I agreed. And it is the first time that I've worked with him on a bill, but uh, I believe that he is a registered nurse and possibly his wife is as well. And when he read the bill with that one change, he said yes to being a prime sponsor. I am grateful to him for his work, again, uh, to the members of the State Veterans and Military Affairs Committee, uh, Michael Nicoletti and folks at DORA, um, and the drafter, uh, Mr. Payne. Thank you. Ask for an aye vote on Senate Bill 76. Senator Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I wanted to just speak briefly to uh, Senate Bill 76, because when it was initially heard in committee, I had a number of concerns about it. And I'm grateful that uh, the minority leader was receptive to the concerns that I raised and that we were able to um, find a workable path forward. In seconds, uh, there was a, a lot of, and, and also in committee, there was a lot of reference made to the dangers of cancel culture on both sides. And um, what I found persuasive was that the words that we speak here in this body from this well, we are protected. But that that is not actually the case for uh, people who serve in other capacities, um, whether they are um, uh, local elected officials, whether they are um, uh, people who serve uh, the state of Colorado or their local communities in different mechanisms. And so the amendments, particularly on page three, lines nine through 14, really help to clarify that we're extending that same protection uh, to those individuals. And I'm grateful that we were able to um, find a way to um, ensure that when folks are speaking uh, and, and doing their jobs, that they're protected. And so uh, appreciate the conversation that we've been able to have on this bill and ask for an I vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the motion is the passage of Senate Bill 76. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 33 ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excused, and one vacant, Senate Bill 76 is passed. Co-sponsors. Senators Smallwood, Simpson, Jaquez Lewis, Scott, Janal, Heisey, Priola, Quorum. Rankin. Liston. Gonzalez. Pedersen. Third reading of bills. Final passage consent calendar. Will the clerk please read the titles to all the bills in the third reading of bills consent calendar? Senate Bill 121, Senators Zenzinger and Simpson, Representative Rich and McLaughlin, concerning increasing the amount of tuition revenues pledged by an institution of higher education. Senate Bill 42, Senators Quorum, Representatives Escar and Will, concerning changes to the membership of the Board of Commissioners of the Colorado State Fair Authority. Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the passage of all the bills on the third reading of bills final passage consent calendar, which includes Senate Bill 121 and Senate Bill 42. Is there any discussion on any of the bills? 
Seeing none, the motion is the passage of all the bills on the third reading of bills consent calendar. Are there any no votes? Minority Leader Holbert. Thank you, Mr. President. I request to be a no vote on 121. Minority Leader will be recorded as a no vote on Senate Bill 121. With a vote of 32 ayes, one no, one excused, and one vacant, Senate Bill 121 is passed. Co-sponsors. With a vote of 33 ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excused, and one vacant, Senate Bill 42 is passed. Co-sponsors. Senators Rankin, Sonnenberg, Heise, Cook, Smallwood, Simpson, Bridges, Priola, Scott, Buckner, Kirkmeyer. Woodward. Gonzalez. Signing of bills. The president has signed Senate Bill 17 and 22. Will the Senate choir please assemble? And in this instance, it could be the entire chamber and turn around to sing to Senator Story, whose birthday is today. Oh no. Well, whether she's here or not, it's still her birthday and we can sing. In the meantime, <laughs> announcements. Senator Winter. Thank you, Mr. President. Transportation and Energy is not going to be meeting today. We will be laying Senate Bill 90 over to a further date. Senator Gonzalez. There we go. Please excuse this pause in the announcements for a PSA for Senator Story. Please join us all and sing into the screen. Senator Story, happy birthday.
It's another story. It was going to be awkward if we had to send State Patrol and the sergeants <laughs> on your birthday of all days. But I'm glad we stopped. I was counting on you doing that. <laughs> That would be and unfortunately, I don't know, but my computer just shut off and the battery is not dead. Don't know what happened. But anyway, thank you for the well wishes. <laughs> Announcements. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues on the Senate State Affairs Committee, we will be meeting at 11 o'clock in the old Supreme Court to hear a number of bills, uh, 118, 85, 83, and 53, uh, in that order. And um, uh, we will uh, see you all promptly at 11 o'clock. Thank you. Senator Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senate Judiciary Committee will be meeting at 1.30 in uh, SCR 352. Senate Bill 005 will not be heard. It will be laid over to uh, another time. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. President. I request a moment of personal privilege pursuant to Rule 37. Granted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, two matters um, to address to the chamber this morning. First of all, uh, I, I don't know if any of you know, I'm not very much of a morning person, and uh, so it takes a lot to sort of get my blood moving in the morning, but I, I read the Denver Post to get my blood moving, and I read it this morning, and um, discovered that the president felt that uh, my uh, remarks on personal privilege yesterday were wrong. I, I regret that. I don't regret my remarks. I regret that you felt they were wrong. Um, I, I appreciate, however, that as a result of uh, uh, our exchanges that uh, you and the minority leader had uh, good conversation concerning this issue and the invitation to engage in uh, discussions over what is a very serious issue, not to uh, politicize, although this place is inherently political and the issues inherently are, uh, nor to uh, strain at the gnat about any particular issue, but to find the solution. So I uh, appreciate that, Mr. President, and uh, again, I, as I say, uh, I, I don't feel I was wrong, but I, I regret that uh, others may feel that way. Uh, and and more, more momentous and more serious and completely different topic, members, um, as you know, over the past 24 hours, Russia has invaded the sovereign nation of Ukraine. Um, I have a particular affinity for Ukraine, having been there in 2014 for two elections for the people who desperately, desperately wish to have a transparent, honest, uh, open democracy. Um, the limitations of um, national security and power limit what we might do in the coming time, but I, I fear that the world uh, order as we have known it for some years in the post-Cold uh, War era uh, has come to an end in the past 24 hours, a definitive end. Um, I ask for a, a moment of silence for the people of Ukraine and those who uh, have already lost their lives, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Gardner. The Senate will observe a moment of silence. Thank you, members. 
Uh, Senator Gardner and others, I, I appreciate your comments. Um, I think in light of the more the, the latter part of your comments, I, I let's always every day recommit to dialogue and recommit to conversation because in light of obviously we get stuck in our ways and we think about what is happening here on a daily basis and we think this is this is the world. And of course, reading the news late last night and this morning, um, the world is much bigger and there are a lot of people struggling and are going to be facing an immense amount of suffering in the coming days. So I appreciate your comments. Um, uh, I, I encourage all of us, including myself, to, to keep in mind that we need to keep our doors open to solve problems together. Um, because as we've seen in other parts of the world, dialogue does not always happen and it is a cornerstone of our democracy. So I recommit and I appreciate your comments. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a privilege and an honor to serve with you. You as well. Thank you, Senator Gardner. Senator Coker. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for a moment of personal privilege also. Granted. Thank you. And thank you to the Senator from El Paso County uh, for bringing up the issue on, on Ukraine. I was up late last night and early this morning also thinking about that, worried about it. So I decided to put my thoughts on paper because I'm not as good going off the top like he is. Colleagues, I went to bed last night worried, woke up nervous and fearful. We are focused here on the problems facing us in this state, problems we are facing daily. We're working together to address those problems so we can have an immediate impact on improving the lives of Coloradans. However, we are on the brink of war in Europe. A despot has invaded a sovereign neighbor for no viable reason. A despot who has been emboldened over the last six years, emboldened by influencers who failed to denounce his actions taking the lives of innocent citizens of another nation. A despot who is trying to turn back time to the days of the Iron Curtain and the Cold War, to a time when we worried a nuclear holocaust could happen at any moment. Colleagues, those days are here again. We are on the verge of history repeating itself. This despot is threatening nuclear war again. This attack on the Ukraine democracy will have a tidal effect on the world. I worry for our nation and our allies. I worry for our troops and youth who may be called upon to defend not just our democracy, but democracy throughout Europe and the world. The threats are more than physical attacks. They include cyber warfare that can cripple our infrastructure, utilities, finance, and government things we take for granted but are necessary to our lives and livelihoods. We heard today in the Joint Tech Committee the importance of our state's efforts in strengthening cybersecurity, and we need to continue to expand and support these efforts. I worry we forget the lessons of the past. Words of support or expressing no need for action are proof some of us have forgotten these lessons to stand up to dictators, authoritarians, despots, and any other words to describe power-hungry rulers. We must have leaders who do not appease this Russian dictator, Putin. This is a moment in history where we, as individuals, as a nation, need to stand up to authoritarianism. We start with opposing any type of support or admiration for such despicable actions and leaders. Those who hold their tongues or defend these actions are modern day Neville Chamberlains. If you don't know who that is, find out, and maybe you will understand the consequences. Colleagues, please recognize our actions or lack of have consequences, not just here, but around the world. We are not isolated to world events. This is a global economy, a global community. Please be aware and help us be prepared. It is vitally important that we keep collaborating, working together 
to move Colorado forward, make Colorado stronger, and keep Colorado safe, thus doing the same for this great nation of ours. Thank you. Members, we, we do have some uh, bills to introduce uh, before we adjourn. You're welcome uh, to, to leave if you would like. Um, I, will, I do want to say one uh, last announcement, though, um, since we're in announcements before you leave. Um, there have been discussions around uh, changes to uh, the COVID safety protocol. And I've talked with several of you, and we've had conversations, and I know folks have been asking when and if that's going to happen and what it's going to look like. Um, uh, we are, um, you know, having conversations with staff, with members, with uh, the lobby, et cetera, to, to ensure that we are aware of what folks are comfortable with, what seems appropriate given CDC guidance um, and uh, the change in, the, um, in the, the infection rates, et cetera. Um, we expect to have uh, a more formal uh, announcement tomorrow. Um, to, to outline uh, the changes that will be coming. We expect those changes to be in effect starting next week. Um, uh, if you have concerns, if you have uh, guardrails that you would like to see or not see in a new policy, um, I'm all ears and would welcome that conversation. Uh, no matter what, though, my request is that whatever the protocol says, we all continue to be considerate of others. Um, obviously, these mask requirements, social distancing, et cetera. Although important and uh, I believe leads to saving lives when done uh, across large populations, it has been inconvenient, there's no question. However, as we ease these um, protocols, keep in mind that that relaxation will then be more inconvenient for others who are in high risk because they will feel the need to be extra protective. So let's keep that in mind. Let's do this together and make sure that we're uh, considerate of our staff, of uh, folks who are in the building, not just members who um, are here because this is their job and they rely on it for their paycheck. So more to come, but happy to have conversations in the meantime, but we'll have a further announcement tomorrow. Introduction of bills. Senate Bill 139, Senators Buckner and Coleman, Representative Herod, concerning the establishment of Juneteenth as a state holiday. State Veterans and Military Affairs. Senate Bill 140, Senators Coleman, Representative McLaughlin, concerning the expansion of experiential learning th opportunities through relationships with employers and in connection therewith, establishing a work-based learning incentive program, a digital navigation program, a career-aligned English as a second language program, and a global talent task force to study in-demand occupations. Business, Labor, and Technology. House Bill 1034, Representatives Byrd and Sandridge, Senators Garcia and Priola concerning the administration of retirement plans administered by the Fire and Police Pension Association and in connection therewith, merging the statewide defend benefit plan, statewide hybrid plan, and the Social Security Supplemental Plan into a single new statewide retirement plan. Finance. House Bill 1046, Representative McLaughlin and Catlin, Senator Winter concerning authority for local governments to designate highways under their jurisdiction for over snow use only. Transportation and energy. House Bill 1089, Representatives Woodward and Senator Winter concerning a requirement that transportation network companies provide insurance to protect individuals from damages caused by uninsured motorists. Transportation and energy. House Bill 1090s, Representative Ransom and Young, Senators Buckner and Smallwood concerning allowing a child reasonable independence to engage in activities without finding that the child is abused or neglected. Health and Human Services. Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the Senate adjourn until Friday, February 25th at 9 a.m. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Senate will adjourn until 9 a.m. tomorrow, Friday, February 25th, 2022.